Hello everyone. We're officially doing it. Wednesday morning, toughest day of the week. I feel like I say that every week. Wow, my shirt's wrinkled. I'm supposed to go to a meeting today, but um, may not, may not go today if my shirt's all wrinkled. Hope everyone's having a great, great day. One second, I'm dropping everything. Ah, Mr. James decided to wake up at 2.30 a.m. today. He's not been sleeping well. Apparently that's a two-year-old thing. They regress. We may have to talk about um, regressing back into your leaks on Friday, if, um, if it comes to that. Good morning from Sacramento. It's bright and early in Sacramento. Today, someone sent us a question. They wanted to essentially know, how can players better avoid tricky spots? And this is, a, this is an interesting question because in reality, you know, tricky spots are not such a terrible thing because at the end of the day, you want to make the play that yields the most profit. Now, that said, especially if you don't think you're going to be able to implement a difficult strategy well, quite often you should default to a simpler strategy. So, I mean, the easiest thing you can do is you can just think ahead, right? Just think ahead about what is going on. So a very obvious situation of this that comes up a lot is stack sizes are very relevant, right? So you'll see sometimes players will raise in the spot with a draw where if they get re-raised or jammed on, they'll have to fold, right? So imagine someone raises, you call the big blind with whatever, say jack 10 suited, flop comes nine, eight, three. They check, you bet, I'm sorry, you check, they bet, you raise. Now in this spot, if they bet three big blinds and you make it, let's say, 10, if they jam for 55 or 60, well, now all of a sudden you have to fold this pretty great hand, which is a disaster, right? So in this scenario, you're going to be way better off not raising the flop if you know your opponent is the type of player who will be prone to jam. Now, um, you always want to ask yourself, is the situation I fear actually likely or probable? And I mean, say you raise against an under-the-gun raiser, and you call a big blind flop comes 9-8-3, and you check-raise them, they're pretty likely to not fold, right? And if they realize your range is a lot of draws and a few nut hands they're going to pay off anyway, they probably rather just shove all in. And in that scenario, you should expect to get jammed on a lot. If you're instead against a button raiser, you should not expect to get jammed on a lot because the board does not necessarily favor either, either player in that scenario so much, or either player's range so much. Um, alternatively, say you check the flop, they bet three big blinds and you have 15 or 20 big blinds, now you can just easily jam all in. Or say you, you, you check, they bet, you raise the 10 big blinds and they have 150, well now they also can't jam all in, right? So in that, both of those scenarios, where you're shallower, check shoving all in, and deeper, check raising in a situation where they can't really re-raise you because you could just have sets, right? Um, in that scenario, those two scenarios, raising makes sense, but in the middle scenario, where you have 50 or 60 big blinds, raising does not make a whole lot of sense. So you always want to ask, what is likely to happen? And very often, stack sizes will dictate what is likely to happen. In my very first poker book, well, I'll show it to you, it is... Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, Volume 1. Fundamentals and how to handle varying stack sizes. Very important. A lot of people still don't think in terms of stack sizes, but stack sizes are vitally important. A lot of people think in terms of stack sizes of, like, how long do I have before I blind out? That's the old Harrington on Hold'em method of thinking. How long can I sit here and fold? That's not what I mean by this. I mean, understanding how you can utilize your stack size or your opponent's stack size, the effective stack size, to give you slightly better strategies. And that, that example I just gave with the draw uh, is very, very relevant. Um, another, ex I mean, really, there are a lot of spots where you really just don't want to get jammed on. And when you have a draw, you very often really just don't want to get jammed on. And that's because it prices you out. So how do you avoid that? you don't raise your draws. Or, you know, maybe you decide to lead your draws there. Going back to that 50 or 60 big blind scenario, say you lead on 9-8-3 for three big blinds and your opponent raises to 10, now you get to jam for 50 big blinds, right? That's not the end of the world, it's not so bad. And when you lead, you may even be inducing your opponent to raise you wide. So think ahead. 
Um, as I mentioned, consider your opponent's tendencies. It's also very, very important. Where's Mr. James? He just ran by my door. That's where he is. <laughs> um, maybe I'll grab him in a second. Consider your opponent's tendencies. So one thing a lot of recreational players do that is horribly wrong is someone will raise, they'll call the big blind with jack-10 suited, let's say. Flop comes 10-6-4. They check. Their opponent bets. They call. Their opponent's a maniac, okay? Opponent's going to bet a lot. Turns a um, king. Not a good card. You check. Your opponent bets. You call. Rivers of whatever. It doesn't even matter. You check. Your opponent bets, and then they fold. They view this as a tricky spot, but in reality, it's a pretty easy spot where you should be calling essentially every time against a maniac, right? Alternatively, if your opponent's a super nit, you should be folding, perhaps just folding the turn every time, because those players aren't going to be bluffing, right? So you need to take your opponent's tendencies into consideration, and what a lot of people do is they play right into their opponent's strengths. For example, if someone is a maniac, well, you really don't want to fold to them, right? So find ways to not fold, and making, uh, in some people's minds, big check call downs, checks... Check calls, English is hard. Check calling down with a lot of hands is the right strategy against a maniac because you know they're going to be bluffing so much. So figure out what your opponents are likely to do and then structure your strategy such that your decisions are easy. Um, what a lot of people do is, like say they have jack-10 against a tight player on 10-6-4, they check, their opponent bets, they check-raise, then their opponent jams all in, and they're like, oh man, I have top pair, but my opponent jammed all in, what should I do? And the answer is usually should fold, but you've now taken a very good hand and thrown all of this equity in the trash. And you don't want to throw all the equity of a good hand in the trash. What else do we have? Yeah, ask what is likely to happen. So this goes back to tendencies and corner cases and whatnot. Um, say you do have that jack-10 on, on 9-8-3. Say you know your opponent will like literally never jam on 9-8-3 unless they have exactly a draw or a set. In that scenario, you can be way more happy check-raising the Jack-10 on 9-8-3 because, like even with a 50 big blind stack, because you know your opponent's either going to call or fold. And when they do jam, it means they have Jack-10 and you're chopping, in which case, well, you're going to fold because they could also have 9s or 8s or whatever the other card is, right? Um, that is going to be the case against some very, very weak players, very straightforward players. Um, that said, a lot of weak, straightforward players also jam aces and kings and queens, like hands that you're fine enough against. So, you have to ask how often will something actually happen. And imagine you know that this will end poorly for you like 1% of the time where you have to fold. Well, in that scenario, clearly you should just want to go ahead and raise because you're not going to get... That 1% of the time is just not that relevant. But if you're going to be getting jammed on 50% of the time when your opponent has all the good hands, uh, you definitely do want to avoid that spot. So, keep that in mind as well. I think a lot of people really, really fear the worst-case scenario. Um, I mean, if you look at Game Theory Optimal programs, very often they will recommend check-raising stuff like top pair, pretty good kicker on the flop. And a lot of people look at that and say, why would you want to check-raise top pair, pretty good kicker, if your opponent's mostly going to continue with better hands? Well, first things first, if they're only going to continue with better hands and they have a decently wide range, they're folding way too much, right? But the Game Theory Optimal programs know that the correct strategy against a flop check-raise is not to jam all in very often, because when you are facing a flop check-raising range, it's going to be draws, the nuts, and some top pairs, based on how many draws you have. And if your range is perfectly balanced, your opponent can't just get away with ripping it all in with the aces, because you know you're going to have enough sets and two pairs or whatnot to where they're going to get crushed if they do that. So, you have to keep that in mind. Um, Whenever you do get jammed, you have the top pair, though. Game Theory Alpha Program will say you should often be folding it, which is a bummer. But it knows its range is balanced. The problem is, though, most people don't balance their ranges anywhere near optimally, and they end up um, having to fold out way too much of their range. Why is being jammed not really that bad with your draws if you have enough equity? You don't have enough equity. That's the problem. Brian, that's not the situation we were discussing. We were discussing when you have an eight-out draw. You have, you have, whatever, 35 to 40% equity against your opponent's range. When you get jammed on in that scenario, you need to win based on the pot odds like 40% of the time. And you're going to win 35 to 40% of the time. And that's not quite there. So you don't want to put yourself in scenarios where your call is 
like b slightly break even or slightly losing, right? Now, if you have a very good draw, like say you have straight end flush draw with all the outs, then sure, feel free to raise and then just call it off. That's perfectly fine. That's not what we're discussing. The issue is tough spots. The question was, what do we do to avoid tough spots? And you do that by thinking ahead and figuring out how your opponents are likely to respond. Bill Seymour, my first poker coach. Good morning. Stay warm today. Oh, I, I'm not worried about staying warm. I love being uncomfortable. I actually get to go on a long walk today. We're going to go out there, probably just a t-shirt and jeans. It'll be fun. It'll be nice. Whenever you have a draw, it's very important that you play your hand such that you are either very priced out and you can easily fold, or you're very priced in and you can easily call. Um, something I learned from a Swedish player a long time ago. Make sure you raise big enough to where you can't fold. <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly accurate, but um, it's kind of reasonable. Like, right, I mean, the example I gave with, with the Jack-10. Say you did want to check-raise Jack-10 with a 60 big blind stack on 9-8-3 facing a 3 big blind bet. Maybe you're supposed to check-raise like 7.5 big blinds, or maybe you're supposed to check-raise the 16 big blinds. Uh, making it 9 or 10 may just be a bad play because it sets you up to be in a rough scenario. All right, let's see. What else do we have? Ask, what is likely going to happen when I make this play? Don't just make the play because you think you're supposed to make the play. Whenever a lot of people are actually playing in-game, they revert back to whatever their baseline knowledge is. If they always check-raise top pair on the flop because they think it's what they're supposed to do, they're just going to check-raise the top pair and forget about stack sizes, forget about opponent's tendencies, etc., etc. And You always need to consider those things. Where's James? I don't know. Someone watches James during the day. It's only me sometimes. I'm here with you all right now. It's very important to realize. I'm not, um, what's the word? Um, omnis omnif omniscient? Omnificent? Omnipresent? I don't know the word. Um, I'm not everywhere. I'm only here. All right. However, this is where this uh, avoiding tricky spot topic gets... Uh, difficult. It is sometimes the pl most plus EV play is going to lead to many more difficult spots. Omnipresent. Yeah, I got that one. I think there's another one though. Oh, the other one's knowing everything, right? Yeah, I don't, definitely don't know everything. I don't know everything and I'm not everywhere. It's cold in Germany and you're not wearing a jacket. Nice. Woo! -hoo! All right. You busted 224th out of 1,400 players. Almost good run. How do you deal with limpers near the small line of middle, middle suited connectors? Limp behind. Easy limp. See a flop. All right. Let's take a look at a common scenario where a lot of people really screw up. Say you have a 15 big blind stack. Okay? Not a lot of chips. A lot of people shove or fold every hand in their range. And that is a gigantic mistake. Not just a little mistake, a gigantic mistake. Because you will find that you have significantly more profit if you're on the button by using a limp or shove or fold strategy. And if you're in any other position, besides small blind, if you're in any other position using a min raise, shove or fold strategy. Implementing one extra option, either limping or min raising, depending on your position, when you're on the button, you don't mind limping because you're always going to be in position post-flop. When you're in other positions, you want to raise to make the button fold. Um, in those other positions, you want to um, you want to you want to have more than just one option. Are Twitter comments working? Yes, they are. The little Periscope option is, or uh, tags are Twitter, as far as I can tell. They're somehow integrated. Um, so. When you min raise or limp with your 15 big blind stack, that will definitely lead to way, way, way more dicey scenarios. And you have to ask, do I want to study poker and do I want to learn a strategy that will yield way more profit than a very simple one? Because it's really easy to just look at a shove or fold chart. I have my own that I made for you all. And blindly follow it. And you know you're going to profit with that strategy. But you're going to profit way more if you put yourself in slightly more difficult scenarios. You know, when you limp the button and you see the flop three ways with a 15 big blind stack, 
it gets dicey. And you have to be okay with that. And you need to study those scenarios. Otherwise, you're leaving a ton of money on the table. A lot of people think short stack poker is bingo. They're like, oh, I don't want to play that bingo poker with 15 big blind sacks or 10 big blind sacks or whatever. But you have to realize people make so many egregious errors on a regular basis that there's a huge edge to be had there. I mean, I, I get an email every day from someone who says, I made it deep in a tournament. Should I have chopped when we were playing three-handed with 10 big blind stacks? And the answer is absolutely not. Is it true that online players use a computer program to assist play? Maybe you're referring to a heads-up display, and the answer is absolutely yes. You're not playing well if you are not using heads-up display, at least in my opinion. Let's see... So where's the push-fold threshold? Often, well, so again, this is something else a lot of people don't understand because they have not studied the game. K2, P2, you have to study the game. And you're gonna find that from late position, it's roughly 12-ish big blinds or shallower. You can usually open jam everything. From early position, it's usually 10 big blinds or less, you can jam everything. Um, with something like a 15 big blind range on the button, open jamming or folding is gonna be like just, slightly worse than having a limping strategy but from early position with 15 big blinds open jamming 15 big blinds is almost like never ever used it's just not a good play because you're open jamming into so many people what would a limp slash min raise range look like with 15 big blinds often it is the hands that are really really good and the hands that are not quite good enough to jam um, if you look at a, a chart you'll uh, the gto chart you're going to see that you're min-raising your aces and kings and queens and ace-king and ace-queen, and you're jamming the stuff like ace-x offsuit, small pairs, junky suited connected hands, um, some big cards. So basically the hands that are not quite good enough. It's essentially you're, you're min-raising with a polarized range, and you are jamming the stuff in, in between. What are my thoughts on poker stars banning seat scripting? That's obviously a good thing. And the ideal world, all programs should be banned. The problem with banning programs is it's hard to track it. It's hard, hard, hard to track it. You're watching and playing live at the same time. Is that a good idea? Listening and playing is probably good. You don't need to watch me. I'm just a talking head here. Um, what does it mean when people say they get bullied in regards to poker? It means that people are re-raising them a lot and they don't know how to deal with it. Um, so, what are some other spots you may find yourself in? If you look at a lot of the very great, loose, aggressive players who are a lot of fun to watch, I mean, Tom Dwan's a good example, right? Tom Dwan and Gus Hansen. I remember watching them play on TV, and they would be playing all sorts of garbage. When you play all sorts of garbage, you find yourself in dicey spots that are crappy, right? And they think that they can still play those junky hands profitably. Essentially what you're saying, when you raise a hand preflop, you're saying, I think playing this hand is better than not playing this hand which means I think this hand profits, or I think playing this hand in some way will yield more profit in the future because I'm going to adjust back to closer to game theory optimal strategy and the opponents will not realize that, right? If your opponents think that you are playing all sorts of garbage but you're only playing good hands, you're gonna crush them, right? So, is that worth it? You're gonna find that almost all, oh hey, you want to come say hi? Box. Yeah, it's a box. It's a box. Hi, hi. You want to say hi to everybody? Hi, Chris. Can you wave hello? Hello. James didn't sleep today. Yes, why, why, why didn't you sleep? Huh? Are you sleepy? Uh. You want to take a nap? Okay. Okay, let's take a nap. Let's take a nap. Oh. Oh. Are you going to go play with Dama? Hi. Okay. You go play? Hi. Can you say, can you blow kisses? Can you say love you? Oh, you love everybody. You're so nice. That's sauce. It's sauce. It's sauce. Yeah, dinosaurs on your shirt. Dinosaurs, yeah, dinosaurs on your shirt. It says roar. For those listening and not watching, this is Mr. James. He's he's showing off. Daddy, daddy. Yeah, that's that's daddy right over there. That's right, that's daddy. That more daddy. More daddy. Daddy's there and there and there. Dad, there's three screens with daddy. And James, you see James? James. Okay, go with Alma. Have fun. Watch out. Bye. Watch out. 
Yeah, you're gonna leave the house. <laughs> you're gonna go to John's house. Love you. Bye. Bye. Oh, that's Mr. James. Everyone says hello, James. All right, let's see. Let him watch Jurassic Park for the first time. Oh yeah, he loves dinosaurs. Does Mr. James go through pre-flop range charts? No, Mr. James doesn't really know how to play poker yet. Um, so, almost all poker players go through this process where they start off playing generally tight aggressive. This is not everyone, but most, most people who become winners start off playing generally tight aggressive. They win because inevitably if you just play better cards than your opponents, you're going to win. Then, what happens? They start loosening up because they realize, okay, I can play this ace-jack. Maybe I can play ace-ten. They play ace-10, they still profit. They play ace-9, they still profit. Then they eventually get down to like ace-2 offsuit. Then they start losing, and they realize, oh, I'm losing now. What happened? What happened is they started playing all sorts of garbage, right? You start playing all sorts of garbage. Those hands are all unprofitable to the point that it kills the profit of all of your other hands. Even if it does boost the value of your, like, your pocket aces, right? If you play 9-2 offsuit and aces, your aces will be more profitable than if you don't play 9-2 offsuit but it does not make up for the fact that 9-2 offsuit is just terrible. So, inevitably, they revert back to playing tight aggressive again. And, you know, they, there's always some equilibrium. And eventually you find roughly the range over time that you think is ideal. And this happens to everyone. Um, this is how people evolve in the way they have a default strategy. If you are thinking about the game, of course. If you're just, like, mildly playing, you may never figure it out. But everyone, in theory gets closer and closer to GTO as time progresses. Or closer to the optimal strategy against their opponents. Not closer to GTO, but the optimal strategy against the opponents. So if everyone's just really bad and tight and passive, you'll eventually learn if you're good to run them over, right? And if everyone's a maniac, you'll eventually learn to play really tightly against them. So you'll learn the optimal strategy against your specific opponents. And for some people that takes not so long, three months, six months, in terms of hands, you know, 5,000 hands, 10,000 hands. Other people, though, it takes them 20 million hands and they never get there. So understand that, where are we going with this? People learn and they improve over time. Um, oh yeah, people, uh, you put yourself in tricky spots and you presume those will be plus EV. If you look at a lot of good players, um, hold a manager charts, you'll be able to see how much money they make with each individual hand. And you're going to find almost all the money is made with the best hands, which is why a lot of the very best online players can play 24 tables at a time because they realize they don't need to play all the marginal hands. And there's a lot of marginal hands and very few really good hands. And at the end of the day, just playing good, fundamentally sound, tight, aggressive poker is quite strong. And also, whenever you're 24 tabling, you realize you're giving up some equity in exchange for being able to play more tables and see more hands. So would you rather be able to play, you know, 40% of the hands for a tiny bit of profit each or 7% of the hands for a lot of profit each? And against bad players, that actually is a question you can ask yourself. Um, I mean, a common question I get it from like 1, 2, and 2, 5 players is, should I be playing way more loosely and way more aggressively? And especially in games with high rake, you should be playing very tightly and very aggressively because you only pay the rake when you win the pot, but if you're winning a lot of small pots, you're paying a lot of rake. And you don't want to pay a lot of rake, you want to pay a little bit of rake. So if you play one hand an hour and you win it 80% of the time, well, you're just going to pay a tiny bit of rake, right? Four or five bucks an hour, and you're going to win almost every pot you play. That doesn't necessarily apply in tournaments where there is no rake once you buy in. Obviously, a tournament has rake, but once you buy in, you don't pay rake anymore. Um, but it is relevant. Michael says, when facing smaller bets, are you using a, smaller bets that are being used in modern poker strategy, you're more likely to put pressure on your opponents by raising with a wider range. You typically should, yes. Um, do you think opponents who will bet wider, with a wider range for a smaller size, are more or less difficult to play against? They are easy, are more difficult to play against because their ranges are wider, which leads to more difficult scenarios because it's harder to figure out what a wide range is compared to a tight range. Why does... Uh, I don't know what this question is. DM 
S N J. I think you're essentially asking why does one site have a better structure than others? Maybe because they want to have they want to be known for having a better structure. I don't know. What's the winning range? That is not a good question. It depends all on the situations that you are dealing with. Um, for what it's worth, I dip, typically do not advocate a tight and aggressive strategy in tournaments, especially if the opponents are playing poorly in a predictable manner, if they're playing on the tighter side or the weaker side. Um, a lot of people really don't want to call off for all their money, for example. So if they really don't want to call off for all their money, put them in spots where they have to call off for all their money. You do that by playing more hands and getting in more spots. Um, that said, if you're playing small stakes, especially cash games, you probably should be very tight. What's the strategy when you're a short stack on the bubble of a satellite? Get in the money. <laughs> what would I recommend for daily tournaments in Vegas, tight or aggressive? Listen, it doesn't work like that. You need to instead ask yourself, Miguel, you need to be asking yourself, what is the optimal strategy against the opponents I'm playing against right now? If your opponents are maniacs, sit there and be really nitty. If they are all super nitty, you need to be loose and aggressive. The idea of... I'm going to get into a tournament and play some default strategy is horribly flawed. Not just kind of flawed, horribly flawed. And you're going to leave a ton of money on the table. You think watching this show is good? Is a good strategy while playing live poker? I think it doesn't really matter that much. Um, ideally, I think when you play live poker, you don't have anything distracting you. Because whenever you are distracted, inevitably you're not paying quite as good enough attention, right? Um, for example, I think... Like, listening to podcasts is pretty bad for playing live poker. I, I mean, but at the same time, I realize sometimes if I'm annoyed or bored or whatever, I will listen to a podcast, and it's essentially to pass the time and pay a little bit of attention. That said, you miss a lot of what's going on. Music is less of a distraction for most people than a podcast, where you actually need to actively listen because people zone out when they listen to music. Um, that said, though, there have been a lot of studies out there that prove that if you listen to music while you're doing things that require thought... You do the thing that requires thought less well, but often you can do it for a longer period of time. So, if that's true, and you know you're only going to play poker for like three hours or eight hours, not actually a long time, then why would you want to be listening to music? Also, music is particularly bad if you're not really good at live poker, for example, because you don't know what's going on. I played with someone one time. And, and every time the action was on her, she'd like take her headphones off and say, is it on me? And like, yes, it's on you. Stop wasting our time, please. And, you know, she thought she was sitting there being cool, listening to her headphones and bopping her head. In reality, she just looked clueless. And that's okay. You're happy to have clueless people at the table. That said, you don't want to be the clueless person at the table. Uh, let's see. All low stakes players have tendencies, that's for sure. Your table draw should ultimately determine what you, what your strategy is. I completely agree. Nick says, your video got interrupted. Bummer. You can always watch the replay of this. I saw on YouTube. Twi uh, YouTube.com slash float the turn. What do you think is the best way to study for a live tournament grind as opposed to multi-tabling online? Basically, is there any way to primarily focus on your A game? Play fewer tables online. Uh, maybe even play a slightly bigger game than normal. Say you normally play $20 games, play a $100 game. One $100 game. And realize your goal is to focus, pay attention, and play your best. Also, to pay attention to what your opponents are doing, right? <laughs> Beware of players when they stop listening to their music. That's for sure. Um, if you see someone listening to their music and all of a sudden... Like, say the cards are dealt. You see someone listening to their music, bopping their head like a, like a fish. They're bopping their head, they're bopping their head, they look at their cards, and they're like... They're ready to play. Yeah, that player has a hand. And you will see things as absurd as that. I mean, that's how bad some people are. Online is a much tougher field than live, that's for sure. You're back from the WPT, you are not ready for the field. Okay. I comment about playing fewer tables is spot on. Good. The World Poker Tour, one hour levels with 40k stack. You thought you would play small, you thought it would play small and slow, but it's a rebuy, so people were in there firing. Yeah. Uh, World Poker Tour, they play maniacal. They're very, very soft tournaments. Should you do more studying or playing? It depends on what you're doing in your life already. I think if you are not already a very good winning player, you should be spending a lot of time studying. 
perhaps half of your poker time studying, maybe more. That said, it's not what a lot of people do. Like, people don't understand. I read, like, 20 poker books where I ever played a single hand of poker for real money. I say real money. More than a $1 buy-in tournament. And that's what a lot of the best players do. And to be fair, I don't actually enjoy the act of playing that much. I enjoy the act of mastering a skill. And you master a skill, I understand, um, especially a, a skill that's not based on muscle memory, right? You master skills by studying and learning the right play in all the spots and then getting some experience learning how to adjust accordingly. Is range construction the best way to learn poker? Well, you certainly need to understand ranges and how they apply. Let's see. Multi-tabling is hard to do while still studying. I generally disagree with this. Um, whenever you look at most players who play online, if you're not playing four tables, or I think four tables is a good number, you're probably not maximizing your time well enough because you see so few hands per hour. Um, if I'm playing online, it's like six tables minimum, um, sometimes a little bit more. I, I mean, I used to play 24, which was the maximum, but I cut down on that. That's a little bit too many. But now, six is a pretty good number if you're playing mostly high-stakes stuff that is relevant. Uh, the nice thing about playing 24 tables is that you can play all sorts of small-stakes stuff, and it makes variance just irrelevant. I mean, your, your graph just goes straight up, which is very, very nice. Huh. That said, if you are purely trying to get better, you should probably play as little as you can and play as few tables as you can and really, really focus on what's going on, just like live poker. You frequently find yourself clueless in certain spots. What should you be studying to improve? You need to understand how ranges work. Go to pokercoaching.com and sign up for a completely free trial. Go through the quizzes, go through the homework challenges, and see how I am constructing ranges and making sure that you're playing at least pretty close to fundamentally sound. Should you play different ranges against different players? Absolutely. You have a hard time remembering formulas and percentages. Practice. Practice a lot. Did I ever bust my bankroll? No. We've been pretty lucky and we never busted our bankroll. Actually, I was really lucky in that I found a game when I was young, 18 years old, that I could play, make a small but consistent return on investment, sit and goes. I played $200 sit and goes for three years straight and turned $50 when I started I was playing Tiny Safe Limit. But eventually I got up to like 15 k bankroll. I moved over to sit and goes and I had like five to 10% ROI for three years and made about 350K. It was good, nice, fun, hard grind, played 12 hours a day every day, had no social life, had no friends besides my online poker friends, and that was it. And that was okay, that's what I wanted in life. Um, so once I had 350K, it's pretty hard to go broke unless you play too big. So what did I do? I decided to start playing too big. And I started playing live poker with you know 1,500 to $5,000 buy-ins. And I lost all of it, but I think 100K or so. But I was smart. I moved down. I went back and I continued grinding sit and goes this whole time. And every month I was making 10 or 20K on the side playing the sit and goes. Um, interestingly enough, I almost did go broke when I was in that sit and go grind. I um, had something like, I don't know, maybe 100K to my name. And I put something like 50K down on a condominium in Florida where I'm from. And then I had 50K left, which should be 250 buy-ins, plenty. But then I lost like 30K immediately. So I was down to like 20K. And what did I do? Well, I decided to go back down to the tiniest stakes games, the $10 buy-in games, and win 100 buy-ins at every level. Just to really prove I actually know what I'm doing. Because at that time, I could still just quit poker, go back to college, have 20K to my name, keep my scholarship at school, and live a normal life, right? But instead, I went back to the small stakes, grinded it up, won 100 buy-ins the 10s, 20s, 30s, 50s, 100s. I got back to 200s. By then, they made 500s and 1,000s and 2,000s, and we were off to the races. Then I get hurt by Black Friday, and I was very lucky. I had just actually won a big tournament on full tilt. Actually, I took second place. I took second place in a big tournament on full tilt for 320K and um, cashed it all out. So I got it three days before Black Friday. So I was very, very lucky. All my money was on stars, and stars cashed us out no problem. So... Super fortunate there. I um, did quite a bit of investing in buying people, pe buying people's money off of Full Tilt for like 50 cents on a dollar. That went well too. We did a bit of research, saw the company that was paying out those 
uh, claims had paid out like every single time in the past. There was like literally no chance it would fail. The question was how long would they be figuring out how much they owe everyone, et cetera, et cetera. And so I figured worst case, the money's locked up for 10 or 15 years, which would be bad, you know, because you can double your money faster than 10 or 15 years. But I thought it'd be like a year or two. Turned out it was like two or three years. So that worked out well. Everything's a math game. Is it harder to make money now than 10 years ago? Yes, obviously. Live poker's still super soft, though. What are the tendencies I've noticed in live poker? Woo! Do we have two books for you. Two books for you. Strategies for beating small stakes poker tournaments and strategies for beating small stakes poker cash games. These are very small books. They're only 100-ish pages. They're also cheap books. You can get them on Amazon for like five bucks. I made these specifically for people who ask this question. Three most important things to winning a big tournament. I don't have, this is not a listicle. I don't, I don't have all sorts of lists going on here. Um, go to my site, jonathanlowpoker.com, read all the blog posts. Did we already discuss difficult spots? We certainly did. You have a few hand histories to review. This is not a hand history review game, or hand history review stream. That's not what we do here. We are discussing concepts. It's very hard to review hand histories. And also, that's not, the, the whole purpose of this was to avoid difficult spots. Not, what do I do in this difficult spot? Because very often, when you're in a difficult spot, the correct answer is, it doesn't matter. Because all the decisions are close to neutral. Interestingly enough, Craig said he thinks Black Friday made poker easier, but I completely disagree with this. The Americans were the fish. This was well known. All of the good Americans left and continued playing. All the bad Americans stopped playing. That's what always happens when they regulate something or they get rid of something in one place. The people who are very good at it will relocate to play it. People who are not so good will not relocate. So that logic of Americans don't get to play makes it easier. That does not make it easier. It makes it a million times tougher. Anytime you wipe out the bad players and keep the good players, the game gets very tough. I mean, whenever um, Party Poker, they were the first ones to pull out of America because they wanted to keep a good relationship, and they did with the government, um, they pulled out very, very early. And whenever that happened, all the good regs went to poker stars. Okay? What happened? Well, I know my return on investment in sit and goes went from 10 or 15% down to like 2% overnight. So why did that happen? Well, we basically were playing the same, same caliber games, except for now, it's all regs and like one bad player instead of four regs and six bad players. So that happened overnight. That is what happens. How do you avoid difficult spots with 50 big blinds? We discussed that earlier. Think about what's going to happen. Plan ahead. Keep stack sizes into, a, it takes stack sizes into account, right? You have to go back and watch the beginning. We already did this. If you missed it, you missed it. Go back and rewatch it. What's my most profitable studying technique? Talking to the best players in the world and learning why they do what they do. I made a book just for you that does that. It's called Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. You can find it at holdembook.com or excelling at no limit hold'em.com, but that's longer. Yesterday you were deep in a $200 tournament playground. You burn your stack with two bluffs. The villains were not aware of ranges versus textures, and they took a guess. Yeah, that happens. S. Dup says you're good but not willing to relocate just to play online. Well, depends on what your options are in life, right? Think about this. A lot of players who got into poker roughly my time, they were 25, 30 years old, maybe younger, 18 years old, 20 years old, something like that, when Black Friday happened. They have no job, no career, no prospects, no family. If, you're gonna, if your options are play live poker and make $20 an hour or move, perhaps somewhere exotic and fun, and make $100 an hour, which would you choose? The answer is pretty obvious, right? Really does depend on your options. If you're like a, a middle-aged person with a family and kids and a job that pays you 100k a year, it'd be dumb to move to go make $100 an hour. But if you're a kid, like the vast majority of good online players were back at the time, it was a no-brainer to move. Three betting range in a tournament dependent on stack sizes or player types. Um, probably player types is the right answer to that. Like you just don't three bet type players, right? And you, and like you three bet with all stack sizes. What happens is your 
um, strategy changes, right? You sometimes need to be three betting more linearly and sometimes more polarized as stacks shrink or get deeper. What do you think of playing signals is the best way to grind online? It's, signals are great for tiny stakes play. They're not so good for big stakes because the game is easy. Sit and goes are an easy form of poker, one of the easiest forms of poker. And because of that, the game's essentially solved. Games that are solved don't yield much profit, right? You want to thank me for my time and my webinars. Well, good. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed them. You always have difficult playing with people who make big raises and big bets. Well, the answer to that is just play tight, right? If someone is blasting it, and you say three or four times bets, that's not even big. If you play live poker, you'll see people making it 20 big blinds free flop is the normal play. Um, that was actually a running joke in a chat I have with a few of my friends at, at WEND at 5, 10, no limit. They make it $100 free flop, so 10 big blinds. That's just what everyone does. I say everyone. That's what every bad player does. <laughs> and that's fantastic. That game is super soft. My friend's crushing it. He just sits there and plays good cards. That's all you have to do. The issue there is that your opponents have made the minimum defense frequency so incredibly low that all you have to do is play good cards. It's such an easy game when your opponents blast it. If you need to work on range construction, they do. They need to go to pokercoaching.com, sign up. We're actually running a sale right now uh, if you're on my email list. So make sure you get that. If you're, if you're not on my email list, you're missing out. We give out all sorts of free content, all sorts of promotions that will help you get better at poker. You can get on the list. Easiest way to get on the list is go get your free trial at pokercoaching.com and you'll get right on the list. Will AI bots ever take over online poker? I mean, ideally, the sites will ban it. Problem is, it's tough to ban programs. That's, that's always the constant issue, is that the programmers are often one step ahead of people trying to catch them. The criminals are always one step ahead of the people trying to catch them. And that said, the, the authorities still need to be trying to catch the criminals, but at the same time, it's, it's a tough race to win for the authorities. Why, are, why does some ranges on the float to turn out different from snapshot? Because uh, if you actually run the math, you'll see one of the two is right. Let's see. Marketing is a funny thing. You can put out an app that has incorrect information and people still get it. Let's find out how that works. It's always interesting to me why people would pay for something that is of a lower caliber than something that is better and free. But it is what it is. There's another way to get on the email list. Go to the Float the Turn Push Fold app. You'll have to enter your email address. That is the cost for getting it. We're not trying to get you for $10. I understand that money is valuable to all of you. And the program was super easy to make. So just give us the email. All right. What else do we have going on? You want, you want to hear more information on playing only good cards. Won't they exploit you and never pay you off? Yeah, if they're good. But remember, these are people who are making it 10 big blinds pre-flop. They don't know what they're doing, right? They, the, the people just, they're oblivious. Even at 5, 10, no limit, they, they don't know what they're doing. And they don't care what you're doing. Would you call with queens... For an all-in preflop from an early position player. Depends on their range, right? Again, a lot of questions like this. How do you play queens? How do you play this scenario? In almost all those situations, the correct answer is it depends on the opponent's strategy. That's it. All right, I'm going to go. I have to go return something to a store for my wife. I hate going to return things. But we'll do that. Um, can we get more cash game quizzes on PokerCoaching.com? Sure. Also, if you know a good cash game coach who wants to make quizzes for me, send them my way. Um, we'll be back on Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern Time. We're probably going to be discussing falling back into bad habits because Mr. James woke up at 2.30 a.m. today. Very, very bad habit for him and for me because I'm the one who had to deal with it. So we don't want that. Louis Flute says, your edge since PokerCoaching.com has grown drastically. Good. I'm glad to hear it. You highly recommend it. Very, very nice. We actually had another one of my students, a member of our inner circle, who won a $1,700 buy-in circuit event in um, Sacramento recently. Got 193000 That's a pretty good score. 
Um, it's always good to, to see the people who are working with on a very regular basis just doing very, very well because it's good. I don't get out there. I don't get to go, go out and play as much as I used to, and it's good to see me teaching people. They go out and play, and they're winning hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in some of their cases. So that's all good. Good, good stuff. All right. We'll be back on Friday, 9 a.m. Eastern time. Enjoy yourselves. Have fun. Enjoy your life. I'll talk to you later.